Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for staying. I'd like to introduce the director of this fine piece of work, Matthew O'Connor, and the star, Amanda Jones, and our moderator for this evening, Ron McDermott. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rob McDermott, I'm the film editor for Hot Press Magazine and a columnist for the Irish Times and personally love films, first of all about smart, interesting young <laughs> First of all, I love torturing all of your eardrums, uh, as well as that, love films about smart, interesting young women, love coming of age stories and love particularly when they come from brilliant and lovely Irish people, so this film is basically everything I've ever wanted, so I'm delighted to be here. And this is Hugh O'Connor and Jordan Jones, and we are going to have a bit of a chat. I'm also going to throw uh, open uh, this little Q&A to ye at the end. So if you have questions, if you have comments, feel free to get involved. But before we start, can we just have one more round of applause? Because there's so many. <laughs> Thank so to get started, Hugh, I'm going to throw this to you because we have seen you on screen, you've been a phenomenal actor for so many years, you've done incredible shorts, your photography is beautiful, like just disgustingly multi-talented, really irritating. Um, but for your feature directorial debut, this is such an interesting project to choose. Was this always the goal, you wanted this to be your debut, or how did this come to be? It? Um, well, short answer, very quickly, thanks so much for coming guys, it's really good to be you. Um, I've been, I've written and kind of directed some shorts and I was working on a feature with the film board and the development guy decided he didn't like the scripts after the first draft and I was depressed and I didn't know what to do and I ended up doing a play, acting in a play and I was um, acting with an actor called Stephen Swift, a lovely actor who passed away about two years ago and he was, I was in college with him and he saw I was reading a book called Skippy Dies and I was thinking maybe working with a writer so I wouldn't just be banging my head against a brick wall and so he put me in touch with Paul, and so I kind of ba basically pitched him an idea about, you know, what if we had no money but we could do a film, would you write like a suburban story maybe about teenagers? I was pitching like Twin Peaks for teenagers, was my pitch, and that was clearly what that is now, right? But, um, so he came back with an idea about two sisters, and that's sort of where we started. So I sort of said to him, like, you be the writer, I'll be the director, and then we won't fight um, <laughs> that much, which we didn't. <laughs> But you had already worked with Jordan because you had acted together. So did, when you were reading the script and coming up with the story, did she instantly come to mind or did this process come later? It sort of evolved because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, we probably worked together in 2017, maybe? Or yeah, 2016. we had done, yeah. So, so it should have been binding the obvious, but it wasn't. But, um, but then I think actually when, when Jordan's name came up, I'd seen Dave Time in short and, and the Frank Berry film. So I knew Jordan. And, Obviously, I had to act with her, so it made loads of sense. And, and, and I was doing play in, in New York with Charlie Murphy, and we saw her on tape. And I remember Charlie was just like, "She's amazing. You cut her." Um, so I'll take credit for that as well. <laughs> Um, so the short that we're referring to is Heartbreak by Emma Kerwin, which is so stunning and went completely viral and brought Jordan to all these audiences who immediately appreciate her talent. And I used to be here, which is a very stunning film. But Jordan, reading the script then, and also the prospect of working with you, who you've worked with, getting to, first of all, getting to work with a director who's also an actor must be so appealing because I would presume that there's a level of empathy and awareness of what actors want to do and how they want to collaborate. So that must have been like very comforting. Um, yeah, I was very lucky to have Hugh as a director and um, I, it was definitely noticeable that he was an actor as well and it really benefited my role and um, he allowed us so much space and freedom to play around with the role and um, yeah, it was just, I was immediately comfort, uh, comfortable on set because I had worked with him and I knew that he was a lovely person and yeah, it was just a really great atmosphere. And tell me about the appeal of Emma, because we've spoken before, and Emma is such a, I mean, if anyone here wasn't a weird girl growing up, if you're a girl, I, I won't understand you. I was a weird girl growing up, that idea of feeling out of place, which I think all teenagers do, but Emma feels it so deeply. Was that something you could empathise with and immediately recognise? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, for Emma, I felt really strongly about how she expressed herself. Uh, through music, through her style, through uh, her way of thinking, even if it was really pretentious sometimes, um, because it's kind of dismissed a lot um, when teenagers go on that journey of finding themselves, and you know they're told loads of fail as well, 
you know, they're delusional or whatever. So I didn't want Emma to come across that way. And we had discussed that together. So we, we didn't want to, you know, change it pretty in pink like Chantel by the end. Uh, they, they both have to um, get somewhere within themselves um, without completely changing themselves because we didn't want to give out that message. So I think that that done a good job of, of what we were going for. Absolutely. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about working together because obviously you're directing and there's a, a another man writing the script about two girls. Uh, so tell me about working with Jordan and getting feedback and how you guys collaborated to create the characters. Yeah, I know. We, we, so we thought about that. We need to own the fact that we're both pale Irish men in our 40s who've kind of worked on this. And uh, <laughs> the only excuse is that it kind of, that's how it ended up happening. But um, that's why Jordan was such an important part of the, the, the kind of the, the construction of it. And, uh, and also Rebecca, our producer, she has, I think she's got like five sisters. Um, and so we, and I have a brother um, who I fought with all my, my teens, and my cousin is a is there. I think he knows about that. Um, <laughs> and I guess everyone has family, you know, and so we all, you know, we all know that, that experience, but um, but particularly from the feminine, female point of view, it was really, really important that Jordan felt like every scene she would, you know, that she believed in, and, and particularly stuff with Mo, you know, we, we talked about that, and, you know, make sure that you were comfortable, and would you would you kiss him? Like, and she was like, I wouldn't. If you were saying that, I wouldn't. So we were like, okay, well, that's what you say then. So it was literally to that kind of degree. And talk to me that, because I love that point about making sure that Emma doesn't completely have a complete makeover and suddenly end up in all pastels and doesn't change herself. Because even in classic teenage films, like The Breakfast Club, you have Ali Sheedy starting out as the glorious weirdo, and by the end, they do give her the makeover to make her more palatable, which always feels like a bit of a sellout. So tell me about kind of teen movie influences and then what tropes you deliberately wanted to play with. Yeah, it's funny. I even remember you writing a piece a while ago about the, um, the slow-mo, the trope of the slow-mo woman walking through. You say peace, other people would say rant, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was very conscious of that. I remember what you were doing going, I hope I was going to be okay with this. <laughs> and she's wearing some pretty good clothes. But um, yeah, I mean, we did talk about the 80s movies. Well, you guys have never heard of any of the ones that we were talking about, which made me feel really old. Um, but, but there were things, obviously, super bad, something like that. I mean, that was a, that was a reference for us. I just saw, saw Book Smart, which is amazing. Right. And just blew me away. Um, but, but yeah, that, that was kind of the. We talked about, again like before about Molly Ringwald and all those movies being quite serious and sort of being the heartfelt one and the one who's actually going through stuff and suffering. She's actually not that funny. She's sort of more, you know, she's just being, being living her life. And, and if everyone else is, is, can be a little bit funnier because she's sort of going through a real process. And that was again something that, that you know, Jordan brought to us. She's so honest and real and can't be untruthful that, you know, we, we, we knew we had that on our side, which is amazing. And what's that like for you, Jordan? Because first of all, Emma is kind of the butt of some jokes in a lot of ways, and she's also in this very complex relationship with Mo Dunford's character. Mo Dunford is so brilliant at straddling the line between being so charming and so creepy. Um, but you have to play the truth of that character. And for that character, this is, she's making all of her own decisions. She feels very mature. She's appreciating the attention and you can't judge her. But then for an audience, we're all nervous for her and wanted to work out, well, what, it's like, what is it like to play with those dynamics? Um, yeah, well, it, it was a tricky one. So um, it was really important that we kept that balance because if we didn't, then I think the main focus would be about me and Mo's relationship. Um, and we didn't necessarily want that. It was just kind of um, something that was thrown Emma's way um, as, as almost like a tool or device for her growing and learning as a teenager. So I almost sometimes look at Mo as like a metaphor mm -hmm. rather than um, like an actual person. Like he needed to be there just for Emma to figure out a few stuff. But I also didn't want her to be like naive and taken advantage of by some man because We've seen that movie so many times. So I definitely wanted it to come across that she knew what she was doing. And at the same time, she might have, she, she was skeptical and she might have known that was wrong, but she still had her head screwed on. And um, yeah, uh, it was a tricky one, but um, I hope that uh, it didn't come across too strong or creepy because I don't think that was the intent. It's not really about me and Mo, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, so. And I think that's what's so fascinating, and again, the idea of upending tropes, because we've seen the, the pretty girl on screen, the pretty popular girl on screen, being the mean one, or having everything come to her easy, and then you learn Chantelle has worked very hard, 
Um, even Emma has like a, a moment where she essentially slut shames Chantel and that flips the script because again we're used to seeing kind of the oddball weirdo goth girl being deemed to be promiscuous. Uh, was that something that was always in the script those ideas and that in really complex relationship between sisters going I'm so deliberately trying to not be you but we might be clinging on to bad traits both of us. Exactly yeah I mean it was something that we definitely tried to do visually as well in terms of costume that you know Emma very much starts to wear some of Chantal's clothes but by the end she's back wearing her own clothes. <laughs> but, but, but slightly you know slightly adapted but not that much um, but that was yeah it was really important. I mean obviously Emma it's, it's seen from Emma's point of view so in a way Chantal can be seen to be you know she's almost made out to be worse than she really is because she's actually gives her loads of good advice is the only one saying don't do this you know and, and you know i care about you but it's emma's not really seeing that because she's you know in her own kind of bubble like we all are so um it was important from from Leah's point of view as well that she wasn't playing you know even though she's obviously a smart person she didn't want to be uh you know at, at the same time uh, she, she's got a little bit to learn as well obviously Chantal, you know to, to be more inclusive of her sister and stuff so they both have stuff, stuff to learn but um yeah I'd love to, I want to talk about the idea of the mirror image and even their distinct styles because I love that shot when you can see the two bedrooms and how diametrically opposed they are. But that's like a theme that comes up in your photography a lot, like the idea of reflections and mirror images. That's right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen this Instagram, so beautiful, so accessible. Um, reflections, guys, they have so work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but talk to me about creating the visual style of the film because it's also, there's so much colour and it's so fun and playful. Like, did you know what it was going to look like going in? How did you, because you, shot it in 20 days which is not a lot of time so did you have to know exactly what shots you wanted how it looked yeah um it was terrifying and um, this like on the, the monitor you kind of have the time going by but it's also got the seconds and it's, the seconds are going by in tens as well and you're just watching like it's hypnotic you're just watching the time go by and you're going how is this even how do we even get anything done um, so i would be i would shot shot this the night before and you know be really prepared so even if you throw it away at least you know in terms of the error going by how far you are in each scene and how far fast we have to go. But um, yeah, we use anamorphic lenses, which which are a little bit more expensive. Um, they're the kind of proper widescreen lenses, sometimes with, with other, I'm getting so, so, so nerdy now, but like if you were to shoot on non-spherical lenses, that's what normal widescreen films would be shot with. You still get the information at the top and the bottom of the screen, but you're not quite getting a depth because you're losing out on that. So with anamorphic lenses, it's just the, that image that's the the kind of long, oblong, that's all you're getting. So you <coughs> sacrifice. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not thinking it's, it's, it's really interesting to me. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but hopefully you wouldn't really notice. It's just sort of like, uh, they're a lovely lens that really give an extra depth. And they're not always used. I think they were used in Ferris Bueller and, and actually Fleabag used them um, for the first and second in the series. But the first series actually used them, I noticed Fleabag because it was so beautifully shot. Mm -hmm. But you don't really notice why, but you just know there's something different about it. Um, and then obviously with the colours and stuff, we, we worked on all those. And, Chantal's world, world versus Emma's world, and that was really good fun. Neil, the designer, and Annie Atkins um, designed the poster, which she also designed the book and the, the, the room, Emma's room, and stuff like that. Annie so. Atkins, who has worked with Wes Anderson, yeah. and who was incredible. Yeah. Okay, Hugh has gotten to be nerdy about his craft, so let's get nerdy about yours. How do you get into character? Do you research? Do you listen to music? And I mean, obviously, this, this film touches on so many themes mm -hmm. and uh, influences and ideas that affect young women today like there is the influencer culture there is conformity generating the pressure to fit in there is romantic relationships there is sexting i mean do you look into these ideas do you decide how much emma knows or how do you do you stay in character how does it work for you um yeah well first of all i don't like necessarily go in thinking that i'm playing a character um, I just try to find a version of myself that, you know, with Emma's circumstances and Emma's life and background, um, so I react as um, a version of myself within her world and who she is, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, so that's probably what you were touching on when you said I, I, I almost come, like, I come across honest or, um, but yes, and also it wasn't that hard because you know, I was a teenager and, you know, I I felt like everyone was about me and that I was holding Caulfield, holding Caulfield yep. from Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, so a bit embarrassing, but yeah, I thought I was edgy and cool. So I um, loved playing Emma because that was just kind of an outlet for everything that I was embarrassed to do. <laughs> but um, yeah, like with, with this one, you know, it's, it's so far from what I've done before. 
everything else was you know pretty dark um like you know like you mentioned I used to live for her that was about a young teen uh, struggling with suicide suicidal ideation and then um rebellion I was a prostitute trying to make ends meet in poverty and um so but when I did read the script it did come across a lot darker you know when I read the relationship between Emma and Mo um but the world that you created made it so playful and colourful that um, Emma really evolved as a character. So I don't go in with, and it's not me being lazy, I promise, I don't go in with so much like research. And I, I always like to let the character grow and evolve and I feel like it, it looks more authentic then um, and more natural uh, without coming in with all, all of you know this stuff that you had collected before. I like to let it grow because you know I'd I'd have to see the other characters and, and how they respond and and Hugh's world to really find Emma. Mm -hmm. So yeah I just like to allow it happen um when the time comes on set usually. Yeah. One detail I love, and we spoke about this before, is that the idea of the accents in the film, which feels like such a relevant thing to young people today, that Chantelle has a very different accent to Emma because they're carving out their identities. Um, so tell me first of all about, was that always intended? And then we've had a conversation about what accents get represented on screen and which get overlooked, which I think is very interesting and isn't something that's explicitly addressed a lot. So tell me a little bit about, was that always a decision, first of all? Well, it was it was something that I guess that, that came up early on, and and, and actually Lee is from Limerick, um, and uh, so you know we, we knew that we'd have to kind of do some work on. I mean, actually, all the actors who play family, like Dylan Morn's from Navan, and Yasmin's from Drada, and <laughs> so we were all spread spread out. So it's more kind of a movie world rather than a real world. But um, when Jordan's coming board, obviously works a little bit in her accent just to soften, you know, so soften some of it. But it was it was I loved that that and Sean is actually from. For uh, so we wanted them to kind of, they matched up really well, and then Lee is kind of putting on a kind of a posher accent anyway. And I know my friend Lisa, she's from Kalani, and her brother has such a dull accent, and he's so clearly not, you know. But um, we, you know, we all know people like that. So we actually put something into the script, just a little bit about it, to kind of comment on it a little bit more as well. Yeah. I see. But we've had conversations as well about you. You have a, a Tala accent, and there are more and more people like Emmett Kirwin, like Sean and Curse Lake, like Stephen Jones, who are portraying these accents that for a long time we really, really didn't hear on screen. And now, because accents have become this kind of weird cultural class thing, people are are finding, are either choosing accents or really making sure to hold on to their own and see that represented on screen. And that's been an important thing for you, hasn't it, Jordan? Um, yeah, well, my friends from Trinity over there, uh, they're in my course, they know how much I talk about being working class <laughs> and owning my accent and I, yeah, that's a big thing for me, um, you know, like I, I, I use my mom for an example, she's um, a politician and she's covered in tattoos, she has a really strong Tala accent, she curses, she's, you know, um, she's definitely from Tala and, um, but, but it's it's so nice because like you said we don't hear that voice enough in the arts um politicians so it, it makes that less foreign for for working class areas um which is hugely important because i want them to know that they can reach that and they 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 belong there too in that world and um so it was a bit hard to let go and um put on my d4 accent <laughs> um but yeah, like, you know, obviously it, it's acting, so I have to. It's <laughs> <laughs> no. hard to be true to her accent, whereas you were also passionately true to yours. Yeah, life. exactly. Yeah. But no, it definitely it needed to be done because <laughs> I'm, I'm brutal at accents and um, yeah, I, I need to work on that. So this film definitely gave me more confidence in trying to, um, you know, just explore a little bit and um, let go of that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for the for the film, thematically it works so well, that idea of what identities they're clinging to and how they're living their authentic yeah, voices. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, we might turn it open to you in a minute. First of all, before we do, just so people can gather, gather their thoughts and come up with a question, we need to ask, the band name Yeast Infection, I mean that's a choice. Uh, were there other band names that were floating around? I just want to hear about the process of oh choosing gosh. that name. <laughs> That was that was cool. Um, yeah, the, the band names were fun. That was. I still think Ampersand is one of the funniest. That we found a band called Ampersand. There was a band called. Ampersand. Of course there was. Yeah. Of course there was. And <laughs> um, tell me a, bit, a little bit with the original music. 
in the film? Where did that come from? Did, would, did that pre-exist the script? Or did some of it did, yeah. Like, we obviously needed to have some ready for, for shooting, and uh, so that was, it was really good fun. John Lewis was the composer, and uh, yeah, worked together on that and wrote some songs, which was really exciting. Um, we had a co co couple of Irish bands who were great, Ships and David Kitt and uh, King Bones, um, who were all local. Um, so that was great too. It was really important to try and get as much Irish music in as we could. So uh, yeah, that, that was that was so much a fun part of it, to be honest. Okay, so looking for yeast infection on the electric picnic council. Um, <laughs> does anybody have a question? Yes. Do we do we have a mic or do you just need to shout? I'll shout. That's okay. <laughs> do you think Dan is going to give the money back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talked about if she was going to bring a bright Dan in there. Um, I don't know how many people get that that in the party that the the girls basically say to her, "You're going to make twenty grand from your from your accident." So we kind of thought that in a way that kind of explains the fact that at least she'll be okay, and you know, it should, it, 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 that, it's a really good point. But uh, I think. She, yeah, we, we, we wanted it to keep going without getting too clicked down, so that was our hopefully semi-elegant way of solving that. <laughs> the sequel is the lawsuit between the sisters. Exactly. <laughs> yes? Uh, did you consider de-Dublinizing it at all, you know, for a global, you know, for international marketing purposes? Well, I think the world does that because it's really stylized and generalized, really. Um, I, I wouldn't have probably you looked at that and taught and taught Dublin. But um I thought it was really nice that, that the characters definitely use like the slang and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah we we actually didn't really want the one thing was to try and not have any recognisable landmarks apart from Ralph Arnhem shopping centre which everybody we've seen in intermission <laughs> which we realised that as soon as you got there but it's still so cool. It looks like a super bad mall. Anyway, um so um yeah we, we that was kind of the rule was to have no, you know, um Haven Bridges or anything like that. We do mention Dublin ones, I think Aaron does, but that's about it. It was more just kind of suburban, suburban, you know, uh, nightmare? No. <laughs> just, oh yes, back. Just when it came to funding, um, funding on the practical note, was it an advantage that you were presenting strong women? We've had a good few male leads in, in, in that, that kind of story of uh, the teenagers and um, uh, handsome devils yeah. and yeah. Richard Day and you know that sort of male action. Yeah, I mean, to it was probably about five years ago and, and even then, you know, it was a ma more male film board, but uh, it was, again, just something that, that felt right for the story, so it was never, you know, it was never done as, a, as an agenda or anything like that, but uh, we just thought the idea of, of that of the two sisters really interesting and a really interesting dynamic that we hadn't sort of necessarily seen in an Irish movie. Um, and I was a bad goth growing up, so I totally identified. You know. Just a really responsible goth in the heat, like just really sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> Not, and didn't even have a proper like haircut. It was just that my hair grew out. It wasn't like it was a proper curette, like some of my friends could back on it really well. Mine was just like a mess. Sorry, that's a reference. There isn't like, a social media account just called Goths in Heat. I'm just Goths in all Goths the paraphernalia. That was yeah, a just during the summer, right. looking very sweaty and uncomfortable. Does <laughs> um, anyone ask a question? Yes. Uh, yeah, what did Emma and Chantal get in the leaving circle? I don't know. If I... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in your course, I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did our best. <laughs> Actually, I know because you're studying film and English in Trinity, and I'd love to hear, like, having already been in film and TV and acting. How is it now studying it? Is it making you want to write and direct things? <laughs> How are you feeling it? Yes. <laughs> um, well, you know, I saw how stressed he was as a director. <laughs> you were talking about the time to get down. I just, I don't know what I'd be able for that. It's a lot more relaxing being an actor. Um, but no, doing film has definitely opened my mind probably but not acting is where I'm at right now. We'll, we'll react. But I appreciate it. <laughs> Actually, you, I'd love to know, because you started acting so young. You were, what age, 10 when you were first role? Yeah. Um, is that in your head when you're directing, particularly <laughs> working with a lot of young people? Like, were there experiences that you had as a, you know, working as a child actor saying, this was very stressful, or I really appreciated when directors did this? 
Um, yeah, I, I, it's definitely in my head. Um, I was really lucky in a lot of my early experiences because I worked with really great people and then did have a couple of terrible ones. I was in a, a horror film called Red Rex when I was about 10, which I don't know if you've seen, which is a classic. Um, <laughs> I, get, I get my head bitten off after about 10 minutes. And I got to see the classic scene, which is literally, I'm, in a, I'm reading a comic book and I, I look up and I go, ah, ah, ah. And then, then I, my head is on a stick, basically, from then on. Um, but the director was really mean to me and he was like quite impatient and he said the first thing which he was like, just look directly into the camera. And I was like, but we're not supposed to look in the camera. And he's like, it's for a camera shot. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So it just got really stressful and they, they brought me in to meet the monster. And they were like, we don't want you to freak out when you see the monster. So we're going to just show you the monster. Here it is, now <laughs> So that totally freaked me out. So I was afraid of the monster the entire movie. Um, and it is quite scary. I'm getting off the point. Um, so I had lots of really good experiences. Okay, so it's your childhood trauma now. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, but no, luckily I had loads of really good ones, so, you know, my parents were really careful about me on in school and stuff, so I didn't do that much, and I stayed in school, so. Okay. Uh, final questions before we wrap it up and let you wander out into the sunshine and into some pride celebrations. I would love to hear about what's coming up next for both of you, because you literally just wrapped on a project today, it was your last day of shooting, can you tell us about it, or is it top secret? I'm really bad, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> um, well, it's... So it's another period piece, so I just fell under Rebellion and Resistance, and after jumping into another period piece, it was really hard today because it was so sunny, and I was in a corset, and it's like layers and layers because it's set in the Victorian ages, it was dreadful. Um, but um, no, it's a black comedy, it's called Dead Still, and it's, it's a great cast, and I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> so everyone keep an eye out. And Hugh, you're working on a couple of projects, including an animated project, which is Yeah, I had, I had an animation that I finished called The Overcoat, so that was, I think, we're hoping that might be on TV this Christmas. Um, so we've been working on a, a series, actually, a different series about an animation project. And uh, I directed by the Free RT called Headcases, so I think that's out in September. Um, I'm just working on a couple more writing things. Brag about who's in Headcases. Yeah, yeah, Shauna Cruz, like, and Charlie Bailey, Charlie wrote it for her, and Shauna running her cell on the Martin. So, it's fun, yeah. Okay, so two things to keep an eye out for, and I think after that film, I think you'll agree. Mm -hmm. You're excited to see what these guys do next, because they're amazing. So everyone, thank you so much for coming. Can you give these two a <laughs> few